It's the common refrain from middle-aged people like me. Why are today's cars so boring? Cars used to be exciting with sweeping lines and character. Now we're living in a sea of lookalikes that, rather than getting the pulse racing, makes you fall asleep. Many large volume car makers seem to have coalesced around one style of car, to the point where it's hard to differentiate one car from another. So why is that? Why don't we have the cars we were promised from the visions of the future? Let's look into why we have cookie cutter cars today, and if there are some exciting cars hiding out there for us to go and buy. I'm sorry to tell you, but you likely aren't the target market for many of today's modern cars. Most people just want a car that starts in the morning, has a happy face, and can play their Spotify playlist through Bluetooth. And car companies are happy to supply cars that do just that. It's not that car designers want to make a bland car, they don't spend years in education just waiting for the day that they can make the new Vauxhall Astra look slightly different from the old Vauxhall Astra, and to be honest not that far off from a 2004 Ford Focus. They likely spent their adolescent days jotting crazy designs on the back of their exercise books at school, and dreamt of making the next modern automotive masterpiece while getting their degree. So why can't we all get cool looking cars on a budget? The original Mini was cool, it made good use of space, it was fun. Why can't we do that? Well, the Mini might have been cheap, but it cost a lot to manufacture because of how it was designed, and in fact the British Motor Corporation lost money on every car they sold. Maybe that's why they ceased to exist in 1968. Profit margins on modern cars are razor thin. Old players Ford and GM are under attack from cheaper competition like Dacia and Chinese manufacturers who can produce cars for less with cheaper labour. Look at the cheapest car you can buy today in the UK, the Dacia Sandero. For under £7,000 you get 5 doors, power steering, front and side airbags, ABS and emergency brake assist. Back in the 60s and 70s you were lucky if you got a door mirror, especially on the base model. And unlike these 60s and 70s cars, the Sandero gets a 4 star NCAP crash rating. Or if you live in the US of A, you can get a brand new Mitsubishi Mirage with power windows, Bluetooth, ABS, backup camera and air conditioning for the low low price of $7,587. And they'll throw in 2 years of maintenance for free. Modern streamlined manufacturing, coupled with lower wages in emerging markets, means bland econo boxes can be churned out for less money than a bag of chips. And established car companies are doing everything they can to stay in business. If they can save a penny on a component, they will, because on a run of tens of thousands of cars, those pennies add up. It's hard for car companies to take a risk on new bold designs that can take years to reach the market and cost a small fortune to develop. One thing they do to mitigate the risk is to develop a common platform for many different cars. The Ford Escort was an attempt first to make a car that would work in all of Europe and then for all of the world. Now car companies are merging so these common platforms can be used across many different cars. PSA, who owns Peugeot, Citroën, DS, Opel and Vauxhall, has said they want to go down to just two platforms for all of their cars, and they make a lot of different models. They've just merged with Fiat Chrysler, where I'm sure they're going to be working to do the same across those models as well. And it's not just PSA doing this. The 7th generation Golf used the MQB platform that was used by all of these cars across their many car marks. So if you're thinking of making a new exciting car design, the first thing you'll need to do is make sure it fits on a common platform. That's not impossible, but it might limit your creative design. And part of the reason for a common platform is each one has to go through a raft of tests to ensure they're safe on the road. The public wants safer cars, so governments mandate better crash structures and airbags to protect not just you, but pedestrians as well. That's a good thing, and, and road deaths have fallen or stayed static whilst the number of cars on the road have been steadily increasing. But that crash structure limits the funky cool shape you'll want to give your new car. All these safety rules add yet another hurdle for small car manufacturers. 
And if you're starting a new car company, just think how much money you'd need to get started while entering a market that's shown slim profits over the years. Remember, this is a market when you can buy a box with four wheels for less than £7,000 or $8,000. So new car makers target the high-end market where they can compete. It's impossible for a privateer to make a cheap, fun car. Even a basic Caterham 7 based on a 1950s car costs over £27,000. And if you want to buy the spiritual successor to the 7, the Aerial Atom, you're going to need a lot more cash. Back in the olden days, we had designers each with a sharpened number 2 pencil behind their ear drawing sweeping lines on a piece of paper, slowly refining the car's shape. They were trying to find that perfect balance between practical shape, cost and style. And along the way they came up with some great designs and some duds, but we'll get to that in a minute. Today we have computers that can run through millions of iterations to find the hatchback, MPV, SUV or coupe shape with the most interior space for the minimum cost. And don't forget a good drag factor because that leads to better fuel economy. Each car company knows customers look at statistics like fuel economy, rear storage capacity and of course the purchase price before they even step into the showroom to book a test drive. So the computer crunches its numbers and comes up with the optimal shape, and so it's easy to see why cars have become so similar. Take the humble car door handle. In the 1960s and 70s there were so many different types, but if you walk down a line of cars today you'll likely see just one style stand out. Most car companies have moved to this style likely because it's aerodynamic. It's easy to use, it fits the style of all cars in the range, and most importantly, it's cheap to manufacture. There are some car companies that have bucked the trend and are trying new styles, and who knows, some of these might turn out to be a better design. Better being more aerodynamic, easier to use, and cheaper to manufacture. And if that's the case, you can be sure you'll see this new style on every new car in town but it's more likely that any new door handle style or indeed external car design will be either slightly more expensive to manufacture, slightly less aerodynamic or give slightly less internal space. The car company has to research if these trade-offs will be worth the extra sales they might see to ensure the car will make a profit. You can be sure they'll be asking focus groups if middle class mums under 35 will be willing to make the switch. It's a brave car executive that sticks out his or her neck to greenlight a new and novel design. And the larger the company, the harder it is to push through radical changes. In smaller companies where there are less politics, it's possible to get the team behind a new direction. Jaguar CEO Sir William Lyons even had a hand in designing many of their cars, such as the Jaguar XJ6. It's impossible to think of that happening at most large car companies now with a long chain of command. It's not impossible to create a fun, stylish new car, especially with a strong visionary leader. But the larger the team, the exponentially harder it gets. When I'm shopping for a car, I tend to focus less on a car's exterior and more on the interior. It's partly because I'm a technology geek who wants the latest gadgets, but it's also because 90% of the time that's what I'm looking at. Car companies know this and spend lots of money making sure cars have the latest bells and whistles and that they're clear and logically laid out. But with cost pressures, they can't use different switch gear and in-car entertainment systems for each model they produce. This is why the sporty Mazda MX-5 has an almost identical interior to the Mazda 3 hatchback. From these photos, it's pretty hard to tell which is the MX-5 and which is the Mazda 3. If you're spending 90% of your time looking at this while inching forward in slow moving traffic, why would you buy the less practical open top? But having a common set of buttons and switches also has its advantages. It's easier to give the MX-5 Apple CarPlay and Android Auto support, heated seats, climate control and lane departure warning when you're dipping into the parts bin from other models. But a less than inspiring interior, in my opinion, really lets down the overall car. I remember when Ford released the Thunderbird reboot in 2000. It was a really nice design, but the interior used stock Ford parts and let the side down. And don't get me started on the interior for the latest VW Beetle. 
We also seem to be seeing fewer car colours. In the US at least, the most popular colours are white, black and silver, with grey not far behind. I think we're slowly moving into a monotone world. And I'm part of the problem. My last car colours were grey, grey, grey and silver. So why aren't we all driving around in neon pink cars? Well, other than that being a terrible idea. Outlandish car colours don't shift quickly from dealers forecourts, and dealers want to stock cars that will shift quickly. Customers used to wait eight weeks or so for their new customised car, but most people, me included, will make a few compromises, like the car's colour, to get something close to what they want if they can have it now. The more turnover at a dealer, the more profit, so they only stock the safe colour choices. Car makers are aware we find their cars bland, and despite everything I've just said, they do sometimes try new designs to make their car stand out. But taste is individual, and one person's stylish masterpiece could be another person's hideous monstrosity. So again, it's a big gamble to try something new. There's plenty of train wrecks where car companies have tried and failed to capture the larger public mood, such as the infamous Fiat Multipler, but there are times when car companies have just got it right. Like the original Ford Focus, it was a wild departure from the Escort shape, yet the new edge styling was fresh and attractive. It got better handling, and in fact it seemed pretty much better in every way than the old Escort. But still, there were some people at the time that didn't like the new design. Sometimes car companies try to create a halo car, that is a car that gets people in the showroom door, but the customer's really looking for a more mainstream model. Like the Vauxhall VX220, that was a version of the Lotus Elise, or the Volkswagen Sirocco, which was essentially a Golf GTI with a less practical, but hopefully more interesting body, and was a bit lower to the ground to help with cornering. But when the Mark III Sirocco was released in the UK, it would set you back between eighteen and twenty-two thousand pounds. At the same time, you could get a Golf for just twelve to twenty thousand pounds. Would you pay the extra two thousand pounds or so to get a bit more cool and a bit less practicality? From the Sirocco sales figures, it seems not. VW's abandoned the idea of a halo car, and there's not much in the way of fun in their current lineup, unless you want to buy yourself a Volkswagen A up. Nostalgia for the past, or just seeing classic cars on the road, makes us think all cars had classic styling. But let's not kid ourselves, not all old cars were beautiful masterpieces. For every Renault 5, Escort RS2000, Opel Manta, or Mini Reboot, there's an Austin Allegro, Austin Princess, Austin Maxi, oh, so many Austins, BMW Z3 Coupe, Toyota Corolla, or Fiat Chroma. But the old, boring cars of the past have been forgotten and crushed, and we remember the fun cars we owned or lusted after. In our mind, we're driving them on that one sunny highway in car commercials that always seems to have no traffic. As they say, nostalgia isn't what it used to be. And although it's easy to say modern cars are boring, there are some good designs out there. And this is the point when you're going to be shouting into your screen and furiously writing comments because you disagree with what I've chosen. And that's fine. Everyone's taste is different, but I'm sure you can come up with other designs that you like. So here goes. The Fiat 500 or 500C is small and fun, and the interior is not bad. Or there's the mad Abarta 595C version with a 7 second 0 to 60 time. The new Mini's always fun, but in my opinion the shape's getting on a bit. But don't let Mrs Big Car hear me saying that. Or there's the Jeep Renegade if you want a little more room for an affordable price. Or how about the Suzuki Jimny? Or then there's the Tesla Cybertruck. It turns pickup designs on its head while creating a striking design you definitely can't call boring. And the latest Ford Fusion or Mondeo, depending on which side of the pond you're on, is a great design that has a bit of Aston Martin flair about it. But not everyone can spend this sort of money on a car. It's tempting to think that sporty cars from the 50s, 60s and 70s were exciting, stylish and cheap. So let's take a look at a couple of them. The MG Midget was just £455. The Bank of England inflation calculator says that today that's around £10,700. 
It's going to be hard to buy a new fun car for that money today, but let's broaden our search a little. Your MG Midget was going to break down and rust much faster than today's cars, so let's compare it to a few lightly used sports cars. A quick internet search shows I can get a choice from a Mazda MX-5, Mini Convertible, Fiat Spider, BMW Z4, Audi TT or even a Mercedes-Benz SLK. But how about that must-have coupe from 1970, the iconic Ford Capri? You can get a cool looking but very slow 1.3 litre version for £890 in 1969 and that converts to just shy of £15,000 today. For that price I can get a Mercedes C-Class, a 3 year old open top Audi TT with just 3,000 miles on the clock, a 6 series BMW, a Ford Mustang, a Subaru BRZ or a Toyota GT86. And while the Capri took over 20 seconds to get to 60 miles an hour, all of these cars can do it in less than 8. Or if you're looking for a new car for just a little bit more money, the Alfa Romeo Giulietta looks pretty spiffy. So are modern cars boring? If you're going for a car that needs to pack 2.4 kids and a dog in, there are a lot of cars that look the same. But you can find many fun and interesting cars if you do a bit of research. And unlike cars that were born when the world was black and white, today's cars are reliable. So go through all the new or used cars available to you and choose something that's interesting. Maybe it'll encourage car makers to make a few less boring ones. If you want to read more, there's a great article on Jalopnik that I've linked to in the description. But for now, a big shout out to my patrons and don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.